So, again, Thursdays we're continuing on through the book of Matthew, chapter by chapter, verse by verse. And uh, this is another one of those just great chapters in Matthew that we can learn a lot of different things from. Um, you know, getting right into it, we'll just look there at verse 1 where the Bible reads, Then Jesus was led up by, of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward and hungered. And just one of the first things we can learn about, just uh, looking at this chapter in this first verse here, it says that afterwards he was in hunger. You know, one of the things we need to understand about the person of Jesus Christ is that when he walked this earth, you know, he suffer suffered physical needs just like we do. You know, he was somebody that had to, as it says here, experience just as something that uh, we might take for granted as, as just hunger. Something you might just say, well, that's something I feel every day. Well, it's something to think about that the very God of heaven came down and felt the same, you know, just one of those basic uh, feelings that we feel physiologically, such as hunger. I mean, that's really something that God would even know what it's like to feel hunger. Now, if you would, turn over to Luke chapter 8. The Bible talks about uh, quite a bit about some of the things that Jesus Christ experienced, you know, in, in, in the flesh as he walked about in a, in a human form, you know, taking on the, the, the likeness of sinful man, the way, he, the way that he did. The Bible says, you're going to Luke 8, the Bible says in Luke 4, or John 4, you're going to Luke 8, it says in John 4, Now Jacob's well was there, Jesus therefore being weary. I mean, the Bible tells us that Jesus hungered, and that there were even times when he walked this earth that he felt weary, that it was wearisome. And it says that he sat thus on the well, and it was, it was about the sixth hour. There cometh the woman of Samaria to draw water, and Jesus saith unto her, Give me to drink. I mean, it's something to think about that our Lord and Savior was somebody who felt hunger, that he was somebody who felt thirst, that he was somebody that even felt physical weariness. Amen. The Bible says in John 19, After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were accomplished, the scripture might be fulfilled. This is, of course, at his, at his uh, crucifixion. It says, I thirst. I mean, at the, at the moment of, ag of his greatest agony, you know, even he's feeling these, these feelings of thirst, these feelings of hunger, these feelings of, weary, of being weary. Look at Luke chapter 8, verse 1. Again, keep something in Matthew 4 all night, but Luke 8, verse 1. And it came to pass afterward that he went through every city and village and preaching and showing glad tidings of the kingdom of God and the twelve were with him and certain women which would have been healed of evil spirits and infirmities, Mary called Magdalene, out of whom was, went seven de devils, and Joanna, the wife of Cuzza, Herod's steward, and Su Susanna and many others, which did what? Which ministered unto him of their substance. So Jesus during his minist ministry was even somebody who needed others to minister to him. Even when he was going about doing great miracles, healing people, ministering to others, he was somebody that had to have his needs ministered to, Amen. you know, that provided food for, provided shelter for, probably maybe even clothing, a place to stay for the night, somewhere to clean up. I mean, he had a human body like me and you, and therefore he would have suffered some of the same things that we suffered. Maybe not in the sense of you know, when we say suffer, I mean, some of us, we suffer hunger, right? We, we really suffer hunger, right? But he felt all these, these things that we feel every day, tiresome, being hungry, being thirsty. And it's just a great example of the fact, and something that we should always keep in mind, is that Christ condescended to men. That Christ came down from heaven and condescended to men of low estate. You know, and he set us an example in doing that. Now, when I say he condescended, I know when we use that term today, it's, it's usually referring to somebody who's being very arrogant, you know, kind of a know-it-all, just kind of talking down to somebody. But of course, when we're saying that Jesus condescended to man, we're saying that he humbled himself, you know, that he took on, you know, that he, he, he took on the form of a servant. If you look over at Philippians chapter 2, Philippians chapter 2, I'll read from 2 Corinthians where it says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor. So Jesus you know, who had all the riches and glory of heaven, you know, forsook that and became poor for our sakes. It says in Philippians chapter 2, where you are, look at verse 4. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to, robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself, and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him, and given him a name which is above every name. Amen. This passage here is telling us that we are to have the same mind as, as Christ did. 
It says there, let, in verse 5, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ. You know, when Jesus came and, and condescended to, to us and took on the form of a servant, he set us an example. That's how we ought to behave. Amen. We should think and act in the same manner as Jesus did. Now, what did he do in this passage where we read in Philippians 2? It says that he, he, you know, he looked on the things of others. I mean, that could be said of Jesus Christ. That he looked on the things of others. That he you know, was willing to go through Samaria. That he was willing to go into the hill countries. That he was willing to go throughout all the land preaching the glad tidings of the gospel and healing many. He was looking on the things of others. He wasn't just concerned with himself. Amen. You know, he wasn't worried about being known. You know, in fact, Jesus even like commanded some people that he healed, like, don't publish it abroad. And then they go blaze it abroad in the matter, you know. They, and of course, sometimes they do the complete opposite of what he told them. Amen. But for some time, Jesus wanted to just do his ministry and not be thronged. That he wanted to keep it. He wasn't looking to make a name for himself. It says there in Philippians 2, in verse 7, that he made himself of no reputation. You know, he wasn't in it to just get a name. He wasn't in it just to run a YouTube channel or have a Facebook profile and have everybody like him or, or not like him or just be known out there. He wasn't looking for a, good, a reputation, good or bad. He was just worried about doing the work of God that had been given him to do. It says that he took on the form of a servant, that he was humbled, and that he was obedient. These are all attributes that we should seek to have. These are the mind that we should have as Christ had. We should look to him as an example of somebody that was a, a humble, obedient servant. That is the Christian life. That is the example that's been set for us. You want to know what the Christian life is about? It's about obedience. It's about being humble. It's about serving others. That's what it's about. Mm -hmm. Now, another thing we can learn about the fact that Jesus hungered, that Jesus thirsted, that Jesus was weary, is that life was not easy for Jesus just because he was God. I think sometimes we can get this attitude when we read about Christ or we hear preaching about Jesus and we understand and know that He's God, that He's the Son of God, that all things were possible for Him, that we can kind of just take it for granted that He had a flesh and blood body. And we can, take, we can just say, well, I mean, of course Jesus could have done that. He was God. But we, take, we, but we shouldn't think that life was just easy on Him. Like He went through all these trials and tribulations that He went through, just, and it was just easy for Him somehow because, just because of the fact that He was God. Go ahead and turn over to Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4. I'm sorry, go to Hebrews 2. Hebrews 2. You guys know probably Hebrews 4 where it says, For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. You know, he can be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. All the things that we suffer, all the things that we feel, Jesus Christ himself has felt. But was at all points tempted like as we are. I mean, that temptation that we felt, Jesus Christ felt, the Bible says. Amen. And we shouldn't just pass that off like, yeah, of course he felt that, but, you know, it must have been easy. It must have been easy. It must have been nice being God to be able to face these temptations and these trials. No, he, he felt the infirmities that we feel, the Bible says. Amen. The point I want us to take away from this is that Jesus can empathize with us in our troubles. He can empathize with us in our troubles. When we're going through some temptation, we're going through, th through some trial, Jesus Christ knows what it is to have gone through that. Amen. He's, not, he's somebody who has been touched with the feeling of our infirmities. That is our high priest. The Bible says, you're in Hebrews 2, but it says in Isaiah 53, He is despised and rejected of man, men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. He was acquainted with grief. He knew what it was to grieve. He knew what it was to feel sorrow in these things. You're there in Hebrews chapter 2, look at verse 17. Wherefore, in all things that behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself hath suffered being tempted. He suffered being tempted. He is able to succor them that are tempted. Now, when I say that Jesus can empathize with us, that's not to be confused with, a, with sympathy. Empathy and sympathy are two different things. You see, empathy is the ability to actually experience the feelings of another person. To actually be able to say, hey, I know what you're going through because I've gone through it. Whereas sympathy is just where you, know, you, feel, you feel sorry for that person. You know, it goes beyond sympathy, which is just caring for and understanding the sufferings of others. It's not just that Jesus cares and understands. Of course He cares, and of course He understands the things that we go through, the trials and tribulations that we face. But it's much more than that. He can actually say, I've gone through that too. Amen. I've felt what you're feeling. I've suffered that. I've, I've grieved as you have grieved. That's what we can take away from the fact that Jesus Christ suffered thirst, suffered hunger, was weary, was tempted in all points like we are that he is a, is a faithful high priest that is able to succor us 
because he himself has been tempted. And it might also kind of bring, help us to understand why is it that sometimes we go through hard times? I mean, and when we, that question, why do good or bad things happen to good people? I mean, why is it, why is it that sometimes that we as, God, as God's people you have to go through some serious hardships? You have to go through some real trials. I mean, life can really, uh, you know, throw you a curveball sometimes. You know, and life can be very hard at times. There can be very difficult situations that we, we find ourselves in. Well, it might be that we go through those things so that we can be more like Christ, so that we can empathize with somebody else. Amen. I mean, Jesus Christ came and he went through everything that we suffer, and even more so, so that he can empathize with, empathize with us. And it just might be that we have to go through some trial, we might have to go through some tribulation, so that maybe somewhere down the road, somebody else will be going through that and we can be empathetic towards them. Maybe we can be an encouragement to them and say, hey, I know what you're going through. You know, let me pray for you, let me help, let me help you. So that might be one of the reasons that we go through things, is that we, like Christ, might be able to empathize. Go over and turn over to James chapter 1. James chapter, or James chapter 1. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 1, Blessed be God, even the God of our Father, Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, and the God of all comfort, who comforteth us in our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith where we ourselves are comforted of God. You know, they, Paul went through these trials and was comfort of God so that he could comfort others who went through those same trials. Now, moving on here in the chapter, it says there that Jesus was led up in the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. Now, it's interesting that he was to be tempted of the devil. The devil definitely tempted him with some things, didn't he, as we read there. But the point that one thing we can learn from this passage is that being tempted to sin is not sin itself. Just because you're being tempted to do something is not necessarily mean that it is in and of itself sin. Now maybe you're being tempted to do something because we're allowing our minds to dwell on something or maybe we're getting a little too close to something and we're flirting with sin and we're being tempted with that way and that could be a sin. But that's not to say that every single time we feel a temptation to do sin that somehow we've committed sin. Because the Bible says here that Jesus was tempted of the devil. He suffered temptation. Go ahead and turn over to, uh, you're in James there, right? James chapter 1, verse 13. It says in James 1, 13, Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and, and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. See, it's not just being tempted, it's actually when you're drawn away by your own lust, and then when lust hath conceived, when you actually have gone through with this sin. That's when you've committed sin. Not just being tempted with it. <clears throat> and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Now it says there in James 1, it says that God cannot be tempted with evil. Meaning this, that evil is not, not that God, it's impossible to tempt God. I mean, the devil tempted Jesus. So we know that God can't be tempted with evil in the sense that someone tempted God to do evil. But it, what it's saying here is that it's no temptation to him. Because evil is not a temptation for God. It says God cannot be tempted with evil. Jesus was definitely tempted by the devil, but those temptations were not sinful in and of themselves. I mean, we know that Jesus was without sin. You know, he, he tempted him how? He said, make, you know, he said, make, turn these stones into bread. You know, he came to him when he was at his hungriest, you know, after 40 days of fasting. You know, when, I mean, that's, that's got to be just anguish. You got to be just hungering to eat something at that point. And he says, make these stones bread. I mean, what a, what a powerful temptation that must have been. He tempted him to tempt, uh, to tempt God, you know, with this care of protection. You know, cast yourself down. He, he said that, the, you know, he had given the angels charge over thee, that you shouldn't dash your foot against a stone. He tempted him with, the, with all, the, all the kingdoms of the world, saying, hey, you can, you can have all these things. So we know that he was definitely tempted, but it says here in James that every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust. See, that what I'm trying to get at now is the fact that every temptation that comes your way is not the devil doing it. Now, with Jesus, it was the devil doing it. You know, and sometimes I think we like to think, that we come up with the old excuse, the devil made me do it. You know, I, I, was gonna, I was holding out so well, but the devil made me do it. But the Bible says every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust. Often, you know, when we, get, when we go into sin, when we commit sin, it's our own lust that has done it. It's our own members, it's our own body, it's our own thoughts that we've allowed to bring us to this place of, of, of sin. The devil often didn't make you do it. Often it was our own selves. Amen. You see, the devil really doesn't need any help 
in tempting us, does he? Our flesh does a pretty good job without the devil's help of tempting us to do sin. <clears throat> you're there in uh, you're in there. You say in James there, but it says in Mark seven, that which cometh out of of the man that defileth the man. For from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these things come from within and defile the man. You see, often it's, it's the man's own flesh that makes him do it, not the devil. Amen. See, giving in to temptation is what leads to sin. There it says in James. It says that when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. See, temptation will come at our weakest moments. Make no doubt about it. I, I'm not saying that every time that the devil's just never going to tempt you. And it might be that you're, you've, you've been resisting some sin, you've been gotten some sin out of your life, you've had the victory over it for you know, a good while, you know, it's something you thought was in your past now, it's not even something that's a temptation to you. But maybe you'll find the devil will wait, and when he finds you at a weak moment, then maybe he'll bring that temptation. So that kind of thing can't happen. I mean, that's what happened with Jesus. The devil didn't tempt him from day one. He waited until he was at his weakest moment to tempt him. So I'm not saying that when we are when we're that we're never tempted by the devil. But I say I would I would probably guess that most times when we're feeling some temptation that we end up giving into, it was probably something that came from within, out of our own heart, something that we've either struggled with in the past or or something that we've just decided to give into. Right. <clears throat> Now, temptation, you know, has to be resisted to prevent sin. I mean, that's what we see with Jesus doing, right? He's tempted of the devil, and he just resists, and he resists, and he resists. He doesn't give in to the temptation. So we know that we're going to be tempted, you know, either of our own flesh, or perhaps the devil is going to lay some temptation on us at a, at a, at a very particular time when we're weak. We have to be ready to resist that temptation. I mean, sin doesn't necessarily sneak up on us. We all know our weaknesses. We all know the areas we need to prove on and work on in our Christian life. You know, what sins are a struggle for us. What's, what might be more of a sin for one person is less than another person and vice versa. You know, people have different vices and pasts and, and upbringings. That, but we all know what it is. We all know what our, what our sins are. And we have to shore ourselves up and acknowledge that and say, hey, I got to be ready to resist this. Now, how do you resist the sin? How do you resist the temptation to commit sin? Well, you could follow the example of Jesus Christ here in this passage, couldn't you? Where he used the Word of God. He quoted Scripture, right? You see, the Word of God is going to bolster us against temptation as we see in the example of Jesus. Look there in Matthew uh, chapter 4, verse 3. And when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command these stones to be made bread. But he answered and said, It is written... Go down to verse 7. Jesus said unto him, It is written again. Right? He keeps tempting him. Verse 8. Again, the devil taketh them up into exceeding high mountain, and showeth them all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. And saith unto him, All these things will I give thee, if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Then Jesus saith, un, uh, saith unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. See, Jesus just keeps quoting Scripture to him. That was his defense. He was just, you know, that's how he resisted that sin. That's what we need to do. You know, often if we're, you know, we talked about it a little bit Sunday night, you know, if you're struggling with your thought life, you know, Philippians 4 9, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are good and poor. We talked about how that's a great way to use Scripture to direct your thoughts, not let intrusive thoughts come in, and not let your mind wander into perhaps sinful things or just foolish and pointless things. Using the scripture, reading, memorizing, quoting, helping us to resist the temptation that comes. The Bible says in Psalm 119, Wherewith shall a young man cleanse his way? How are you going to get the sin out of your life, young man? He says, By taking heed thereto according to thy word. With my whole heart have I sought thee. O let me not wander for thy commandments. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Amen. You want to know a good reason to memorize scripture to get the word of God in your heart? is so that you'll resist temptation, that you will not sin against God. You know, you'll have some, some, some sin come in your life, and if you memorize Scripture on it, bam, the Holy Spirit can just bring that up and remind you of some commandment of God, remind you of some uh, Scripture, some passage from the, from the Bible, and they say, you know what, I can't do that. You know, it is written. You know, get, behind, get, get thee behind me, Satan. The Bible says every word of God is a pure. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in Him. I mean, the word of God can be a shield to us. Against the fiery darts of the wicked. 
And here's the thing, when we start to resist the devil, when the devil, you know, if he is the one that's tempting us, it's not necessarily just on our own flesh. The devil's trying to resist us and, and trying to get us out of the walk, get us out of the church, get us out of Bible reading, get us out from following Christ. You know, if he sees us resisting and resisting and resisting, eventually he just quits. You see, the devil is not going to waste his time on a losing battle. Go ahead and turn over to James chapter 4. James chapter 4. The devil's not going to waste his time on a battle he can't win. And often, if we will resist him long enough, the, the devil will move along. Look at James chapter 4, verse 5. Do you think that the Scripture saith in vain, the spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth to envy? But he giveth more grace. Wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. He will flee if we do what? If we resist him. So God in this passage, it's a great passage, he gives us this formula to receive God's grace and to be able to withstand the devil. And it's noticed, and notice there, it kind of ends and begins with humility. It says there in verse 6, but he giveth, more, but he giveth grace unto the humble, right? And then in verse 10, humble yourselves. So it all starts with humility. I mean, one of the first things, if you're going to resist sin in your life, you have to understand that you are prone to do it. You have to say, you know what, I am a sinner. You know, I do have this sinful flesh. I do have a problem with this or a problem with that. Or this is a sin in my life. You at least have to have, you know, even, even the Alcoholics Anonymous knows that the first step to recovery is admitting you have a problem. Right? So at least being able to say, you know what, this is a problem in my life. And that takes humility. And it's the proud person who won't admit that they have a problem. That won't admit that they're wrong. That's right. they, they, they say, no, it's not me. They'll blame somebody else. But the Bible says here that we need to be humble. And, and then use this formula that God gives us in James chapter 4. What is that formula? It says there in verse 7, Submit yourselves therefore to God. So the first thing you need is you need to submit. Be even humble enough to say, you know what? Submit yourselves therefore to God. Say, I don't want to resist this sin. I want to do God's will. You know, Lord, I'm tempted to do this, but I know that you, you desire I not to do it. Help me to do your will. Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil. Right? If you're submitting yourself to God, you're already resisting the devil, and he will flee from you. What's the next part? Submit, resist, draw an eye. You know, we talked about last week with Philippians, it's not enough to just put thoughts out of your mind. You have to fill it with something else. You, know, you have to take, get the bad thoughts out and then get Philippians 4.9 in Amen. and meditate on those things. Well, it's the same thing here. Yeah, you submit to God, you resist the devil, but now you just can't stand there, halt between two. You can't just stand there where you were in this vacuum, you have to draw nigh to God. Now it's time for you to try and get closer to God so that He will draw nigh to you. You know, cleanse your hands. Get the sin out. Once you get close to God, start getting the sin out, that sin out of your life, and purify your hearts. You know, confess your sin and forsake it, and you'll have mercy. Amen. And He goes on, Be afflicted and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to heaviness. Humble yourselves. Therefore, in the sight of God, and He shall lift you up. So this is a great formula here on how to, how to resist the devil. And it begins and it ends with humility. Now moving along in uh, Matthew chapter 4, we'll, we'll read in uh, verse 12 here. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 4, in uh, verse 12, Now when Jesus had heard that John was cast into prison, he departed to Galilee, and leaving Nazareth, he came and dwelt in Capernaum, which is upon the seacoast in the borders of Zeb Zebulun and, and uh, Neph Neph Nephthalim. Nephilim, sorry, I don't have the phonetics in my notes. <laughs> that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, The land of Zebulon and the land of Nephilim, by the way of the sea beyond Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people which sat in darkness saw great light, and to them which sat in the region and shadow of death, light is sprung up. From that time Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And Jesus, walking by the sea of Galilee, saw two brethren, Simon called Peter and Andrew his brother, that is a good name, brother. See? Right here is again. We're talking about that earlier on Solon. Andrew his brother casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. And he saith unto them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And straightway they left their nets and followed him. And going on from thence, he saw two other brethren, James the son of Zebedee, and John his brother in a ship, with Zebedee their father, mending their nets. And he called them, and immediately they left their sh the, the ship and their father and followed them. Now, it's interesting here that when Jesus Christ went out to start his ministry, I mean, the most powerful ministry the world has ever seen. The most powerful ministry the world has ever known 
where, where God is just preaching, you know, just the unadulterated word of God, the most strongest, powerful sermons that have ever been preached, the greatest miracles that have ever been done. I mean, just the, the, the ministry that just shaped the, the course of human history from there on out. Amen. I mean, what a powerful time to have been alive. It was the time of Jesus Christ. Amen. To walk the earth when he walked. To, we didn't actually see him and hear him preach. What an amazing thing that would have been. But when Jesus started this ministry, he didn't go to the, he didn't go to the scribes and Pharisees. He didn't go down to the temple and say, give me your most learned man. He didn't go there and, you know, he didn't go down to the Bible college and say, give me your sharpest, most polished preacher boy who's got the tie on right and the hair done right and knows that everything that, that he knows about church. He didn't go find that guy. He went and he found common men. I love that. I love that he went and found four fishermen by the sea. Yeah. That's who he used. God uses common people to accomplish great things for him. And that, that's a really something to let sink in, that he went and found just four humble fishermen, people that the world would just pass by and not take note of. You know, they'd just be the equivalent today of, you know, a cook, a chef, a garbage guy, a, a, an auto mechanic. Just average, working class, blue collar guys that just are trying to carve out a living for themselves. That's who God went and chose to use when he started his work here on earth. Go ahead and turn over to Acts chapter 4. <clears throat> I mean, we would think, humanly speaking, that he would want to go find somebody who would have been in the scriptures and would, should have known about the prophecies and would have known that Christ was coming on the scene and all these things. I mean, humanly speaking, that makes sense, but when God decided to do it, he wouldn't found just four common men. It says in Acts chapter 4, verse 5, And it came to pass on the morrow that the rulers and elders and scribes and Annas the high priest and Caiaphas and John and Alexander and as many as were of the kindred of the high priest were gathered together at Jerusalem. And of course, this is when uh, 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 Peter and uh, Peter had, had healed the man in the temple. And all the Jews were in uproar and they arrested him, right? And it says, and when they had set them in the midst, they asked him, by what power of what name have you done this? They say, you know, who gave you authority? Why are you doing this? How did you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, said to them, ye rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if th we this day be examined of the good deed done of the impotent man, by what means he is made whole, be it known unto you all, and to all the people of Israel, by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by this man, doth, 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 even by him doth this man stand here before you whole. This is the stone which is set not of you builders, which has become the head of the corner. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. Now when they saw the boldness in Peter and John, they perceived that they were what? Unlearned and ignorant men. And, they, and then it says they marveled. They marveled at the fact that these guys were just regular people. That they were now it says they were it's not saying that they were stupid. They're not saying they were dumb. He's saying, you know, when they're saying they're unlearned, I mean they hadn't been, you know, through the through the through the Jews' schools. That they hadn't been educated in their system of, of, of learning. Right. That they were ignorant men, that they wouldn't have known all the things that, that the Jews knew about the, the, the things that they taught. They said, Well, these are unlearned and ignorant men. And what do they do? They marveled at them. I mean, it caused them to say, well, how could this even be possible? I mean, Peter preaches a pretty hard message, right? Pretty, it says, full of the Holy Ghost, and he just boldly preaches, says, hey, whom ye crucify, right? Just calls them out. And they say, wow, these guys, but these guys are unlearned and, and ignorant men. And then it goes on and says this, and they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. I mean, you want to preach boldly? You want to do some great works for God? You know, it's not so much about your education. It's not so much about how much you know or you've been taught in some school somewhere. It's whether or not you've gotten alone with God. It's whether or not you've gotten in the Word, that you've memorized the Word, that you've spent time reading and studying the Bible, and you spent some time with the Word, that you've been with Jesus in His Word. Mm -hmm. That's what's going to give you boldness. That's what's going to make you effective. That's what's going to make the gainsayers and the scoffers marvel at you. Amen. When just some common man opens his mouth and just boldly proclaims the Word of God. You see, God uses ordinary people to accomplish extraordinary works. To what end? So that only He can be glorified. So that at the end of the day, they can know this is all of God. This has to be God. I mean, we know this guy, right? I mean, it certainly couldn't be him, but we know where he comes from. You know, he's, he's a dropout. You know, he didn't go to college. He didn't do this. He didn't do that. 
But how does he know all these things? Because he's been in the Word. He's been with Jesus. Go turn to First Corinthians chapter twenty or chapter one. <laughs> First chapter. <clears throat> First Corinthians chapter one. <clears throat> I'll begin reading in verse 26 where it says, For you see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called, but God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. Why is it that God goes to the fishermen? Why is it that God just goes to the common man? Why is it just God go to the ignorant and unlearned to confound the wise, to cause them to marvel? And God who hath chosen the weak thing, hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty, and the base things of the world, and the things that are despised hath God chosen, yea, and things that which are not, to bring to naught things that are, that no flesh should glory in His presence. That's why God does it. You know, if faithful were Tucson, you know, when we, we look at this little building we have, you know, just these few men here, and a lot of other churches might look in here and say, what are you guys even doing? I mean, you guys don't, you're not a lot going on. But I tell you what, when we knock all the doors in this city, when we have salvation after salvation after salvation coming in, you know, maybe it'll cause some other churches to marvel and say, wow, you can do a great work even though you're just a, a small person, even though you're just a humble body, even though you're just, you're not great in stature, we can still do something great for God. Amen. And He'll get the glory for it. And we'll say, you know what, it wasn't of our own power. It wasn't us that did it. It was the power of this book. Amen. All we did was obey it. All we did was go out and preach it. And God used His Word and His Holy Spirit dwelling in us to do a great work. And He'll be glorified for it. Note that no flesh will glory in His presence. You see, God is more concerned with your heart than your credentials. You know, God isn't worried about all the letters after or before your name, the PhDs and the doctors and the, the masters and what all these other accolades that men give, give themselves or each other. They're not worried. He's not worried about that. He's more worried about your heart. Go ahead and turn over to Luke chapter 14. Luke chapter 14. You see, when God uses somebody, He understands that when He's going to call somebody or use somebody in a mighty way, that He has to find somebody who has the right kind of heart to be used by God. Because here's the thing about you being used by God to serve Him. It comes at a cost. It comes at a cost. It will cost you something to serve Jesus Christ. It's going to cost you something to go out and do a great work for God. If you want to be used by God to fulfill His will, His will and to reach the lost, you better mark it down right now that's going to cost you something. If you're going to be used mightily of God and stand up and preach the Word with boldness, you better believe that it's going to cost you something. That somebody's not going to like what you have to say, that you're going to have to go through some tribulation or trial, or that you know, it might cost you a friendship or a relationship in your life. It's going to cost you something to serve God. That's why God is more concerned with your heart than He is with a bunch of credentials. That's why God went to ignorant and unlearned men. That's why God went to fishermen rather than a bunch of pump, puffed up and pompous you know, Pharisees and scribes. He said, you know what, I want to go use somebody who has the right heart. I'm not so worried about, you know, they're humble enough to let me use them. I don't care if they're polished. I don't care if they have every, all their, you know, their, their ducks in a row and everything's lined up right and they're, they're squeaky clean and everything's just perfect about them. He said, they got the right heart. I'll use that person. Amen. Look at Luke 14, verse 26. If any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, in his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. It's going to cost you something, potentially, to be God's his disciple. And whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. He goes on and says in verse 28, For which of you, intending to build a tower, sitteth not down first and count up the cost, whether he hath sufficient to finish? Lest happily after he hath laid the foundation is not able to finish it, all that begin, uh, be, all that behold to begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king, going to make war against another king, sitteth not down first and consulteth whether he is able with ten thousand to meet him that cometh against him over twenty thousand? Or else, while the other is yet a great way off, he sendeth an ambassage and desireth conditions of peace. So likewise, whosoever he be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. Now, did Jesus say that you have to forsake everything? That you have to hate everybody? No, but he did say, you know, if you're not willing, if it, does, if it comes to that, 
and it just very well, it just might in your own life to some degree or another, you cannot be my disciple. There comes a point where God, where people will say, you know what, that's going to cost me too much. They're going to bow out. Yeah. Whether and it might not even be any of these things on this list, it might just be some pet sin, some sin they have in their life, and the preacher gets on it. Ouch, that's too much. That's a little too close to home. I'm, I'm done. And it costs them. And they say, you know what, not worth the price. Or maybe it will cost you some relationship to take a stand on the Word of God. You know, maybe some relative will say, hey, your, your preacher believes that? Yeah. I don't know if I want anything to do with you. Has that ever happened to anybody? You better believe it. And it might happen to us. So we have to ask ourselves, we need to sit down and count the cost or whether or not we're willing to pay it. And that's why God is more concerned with your heart than He is with a bunch of letters behind your name about whether or not you've got all the world's accolades. He's more concerned about how far you're willing to follow Him, what's on the inside, what price you're willing to pay than He is anything else. Amen. So are we willing, as these fishermen were, to leave our nets? I love it. They, they left their nets, and then it says they left their ships, and the last guy, they left their own father. They left everything that they had. They left the nets, you know, their work. They left the ship, their goods. They even left family to go out and follow Christ. <clears throat> now, God uses the base things of the world. We see that. And God uses simple, simple people to accomplish His will in this world. So when God uses somebody, to what end does He use them? What is the work that we go out and do? Let's say, you know what, I, I'm counting the cost. I'm willing to follow you know, God, I want to be used. I'm willing to pay the price. Well, okay, well, what's the work that He's going to have you to do? It's to win souls. Amen. That's the work. People want to know, what's the will of God for my life? To win souls. Amen. Amen. I mean, I don't know how much more I can sum it up for you. To go save the lost, to seek and save that which is lost. Was that not Christ's purpose on earth? Amen. I mean, that's what He did. Why he wouldn't, and it hasn't differed at all today. You know, we are ambassadors for Christ. You know, God is beseeching the world by, uh, by us. He's beseeching the world to be reconciled unto Him by us. Look there in Matthew chapter 4. Oh, I'm sorry, if you're still, I think it's actually in Luke. <clears throat> no, Luke 4. Just keep something in Luke, though. Luke 4, verse 19. And He saith unto them, what was it after they, after they, when they, when he called Peter, when he called Andrew, casting a net to the sea, for they were fishers, and he saith unto them, Follow me. What did he say? Did he just end there? Just follow me. You know, just check me out. See what I do. See if you like it. See if it's your thing. You know, do, do whatever you want. However you feel like you need to serve me. You know, just flesh that out. Just feel that out. Let the Spirit lead. You know, maybe you need to go into the bar and, and, and drink water and shoot pool with the guys and try and just jive with them about me. You know, or maybe you need to get some, some crazy, some, some lifestyle evangelism or some interesting new way of, of trying to slowly give people the gospel over a series of months or even years. Develop a relationship with someone and get to know them and have them over for dinner and talk to them. And, you know, make sure you plant a nice garden so your neighbors will notice. Maybe they'll come over and talk to you about Jesus. You know, is that what he said? Just follow me and, and you figure it out. He said, no, follow me. What did he say there? And I will make you fishers of men. That tells me right there that if you're following Jesus, you will be a fisher of men. You will be somebody who's going out to catch men. Amen. Amen. That's what you'll be doing. If you're still in Luke 5, look at verse Luke chapter 5. Luke chapter 5. He reiterates this in Luke chapter 5. Verse 8. It's a parallel passage. He says in verse 8, when Simon Peter saw it, I'm sorry, it's not a parallel passage. He fell down at Jesus' knees saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he was astonished and all that were with him at the draught of fishes which they had taken. And so also was James and John, the sons of Zebedee, which were partners with Simon. And Jesus said unto Simon, Fear not, from henceforth thou shalt catch men. That's what you're going to do if you're going to follow Jesus. You're going to be a fisher of men. You're going to catch men. And when they brought their ships to land, they forsook all and followed him. That's why Jesus is more concerned with what's in your heart. That's why Jesus uses humble, simple people that will just understand that it's not about them, it's not about their own goodness, and it's about the work that God has given them to do, which is to go out and to win souls. Look at uh, uh, Matthew chapter 4. We'll move on here. We'll wrap it up here. Verse 23. Matthew chapter 4, verse 23. 
And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom. Now, it's nice to notice that, that he preached the gospel of the kingdom. You know, he didn't go out and preach the social gospel. He didn't go down to the Roman governor's you know, office, the courthouse, and try to get involved in the, in the world and, and start talking about how they can let's pass laws you know, to better you know, human, you know, uh, the child welfare laws or something like that. Try to get involved in just you know, taking Christian principles into the, into the government. and try to, That's not what he was about. He wasn't into some social gospel. He went and he preached the kingdom of heaven. You know, he had his eyes on, things with, on that which is above. He was more concerned with bringing people into the kingdom of God than just trying to reform the world. You see, when you, a lot of people get caught up in that this 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 idea of a social gospel, of trying to just reform the world, of you know, of put and, and I don't know if anyone's noticed, but this country actually isn't getting any more Christian. <laughs> it's getting less and less Christian every day. People want less and less to do with the Bible every single day. You know, and people get, want to get up all in arms about you know how we're gonna make sure that the government you know is 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 uh, you know trying to put some kind of Christian principle into place. They're trying to Christianize the world through through government. It's not gonna happen. But I tell you what, when the kingdom does come, when Jesus does come back with his saints to be glorified in them, and God, and when he does set up the millennial reign, when he comes back with you know all of his saints and and bank, you know and sets up the millennial kingdom, society will follow. Amen. Society Amen. will, whether they like it or not. Amen. Then, then we'll, then we'll have, you know, all the social reform we want, Amen. and it'll be right down the line of everything that's in this book. Amen. And, the, and, and the, you know, and there won't be any debate about it. It'll just happen. <clears throat> so the point I kind of want to make here is that when Jesus is out preaching the gospel, and he's healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people, and his fame goes out throughout Syria, you know. He's more worried about trying to breach people with the gospel. We shouldn't get so caught up in trying to help everybody. You know, there's nothing wrong with, of course, helping somebody out and, and, and doing good unto others, you know, as we have opportunity to do, give, do good unto all men. But let me just say that most people would find the help they need if they would join a local church. That is God's instruments to help people when they're down on their luck, is the local church. It's, it's that's, and the local church is there to help its members. I and mean, that's why it's real important for people in a church to get to know each other and get to begin to develop friendships and, and, and relationships with one another so that we can check up on one another so that people have someone to go to and say, hey, I, I need some help here. You know, that we can help one another out. That's the importance of a local body. That's, the local church is not just here to, to uh, pat itself on the back. We're actually here to be to help one another. That's the purpose of it. And of course, it's to go out and reach the lost. But within the walls of this church... You know, we should seek to help one another, to help the members that are here. Go ahead, and uh, I know I'm going a little long, but we'll wrap it up here. Go ahead and turn to James chapter 2. James chapter 2. James chapter 2. Because <clears throat> a lot of people, they get real wrapped up. You know, they want to be involved in a church that's going to, you know, hand out blankets and do food drives and everything like that. And Look, I'm not down on that. That's great. But... I'm not, I don't think that's the focus right. by any means. That's, that's, that the local church itself, you know, if people would get right and get saved and get right with God, they'd find the help that they need here. But unfortunately, the local church, it seems to just be getting smaller and smaller. And, and that's why people are having to go elsewhere. Now they're having to go out and find help um, when they're down on their luck in other places. But it says there in James chapter 2, verse 15, If a brother or a sister be naked and destitute of daily food, Meaning somebody, you know, in Christ, your brother in Christ, your sister in Christ is destitute of daily food. And one of you saying in the depart in peace, be you warmed and filled. You know, how is that how does that profit them? You know, we should be looking to help our brothers and sisters in Christ. Amen. It is our family in Christ that needs help. Not every derelict on the corner. Right. Yeah. Not every able bodied young man who doesn't want to get off drugs, that is too lazy to go out and get a job however menial it is, that would rather just stand by the freeway and beg for money. Right. You know, and I, I understand some people are in a hard position. They have, maybe they have mental problems and things like that. And, and we should, and the Bible says in Proverbs 29, verse 7, the righteous considereth the cause of the poor. They don't, you know, I don't think we should just be hand, blindly handing out money to every guy that asks us for a dollar. Yeah. Because you don't know where he's going to spend that. Right. You, and the people have this, and I understand, I've been there, your heart strings, you're like, oh, this poor guy. 
He looks so down, but why is he there? Has he burned every bridge? Has he been a rebellious son? You know, and, and totally, you know, just burned every bridge he's ever had. Doesn't want anything to do with church. Doesn't want anything to do with God. He's just living in complete rebellion. Just wants to be a burden on society. Don't let that guy pull your heartstrings. Amen. That guy's a bum. That guy needs to go out and get a job. He needs to clean up his life. You know, that's 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 the, the truth of the matter. Amen. It's our family in Christ, not every single person that has a, a sob story that we need to help. It says there in James 2, and you say unto one and, and, and one of you say unto them, Depart. You know, saying, Hey, go, depart, right? Well, in order to depart somewhere, you have to have been there. So it's a, you know, if some brother and sister comes and Christ comes into the church saying, Hey, you know, I need a bag of groceries. My heat got turned off. I'm down on my luck. You know, something came up this month. I couldn't pay this bill. The light electricity got turned off. Depart, be warm and filled. Right? <laughs> but the point I'm trying to make is it's somebody that's there. It's somebody that's actually going to church. I think it's a great answer to say, when somebody asks you for a dollar. Where'd you go to church last week? Uh uh. Why don't you go ask your church? Why don't you go ask your pastor? Why don't you go ask some brother and sister in your church? Because you, on Sunday, you were you know, recovering some from, from a night out at some strip club. You were out clubbing it up, out living the life, right? And that's what a lot of these guys do. I'm, I'm just going to, and I hate to break this on people, but they'll take that money you give them on the street corner, and they'll turn right around and go into some bar. Yeah. And that's what, the only, that's what they're living for. So that's a good, answer, ask, that's a good uh, question for them. Hey, Where'd you go to church? Why don't you go over there and be warm and filled and get involved in your local church? <clears throat> One thing, I re I've never had the boldness to do this, but every time a guy asks me, I want to do it. I never do it. and Because you can see these guys a mile away, right? Like I'm walking in a Best Buy up here last week, and the guy's looking like this, and he's standing. He's obviously homeless, and he's just this young guy. And, you know, he sees me coming, and it, just, it bothers me when they ask me because it just makes me feel like, do I look like a schmuck? Do I look like I'm just <laughs> that much of a sap that I'm so, oh, here you go, you know? And I've never had the, I've heard a guy did this, he said, uh, right before the guy asked him, he said, hey, you got a dollar? You just beat him right to it, you know, I'm like, hey, you got any change? You know, just beat him to the punch. And the guy, the guy, he would do this in Chicago. And, and, and I was like, man, I want to do that someday. I've never had, had the boldness. I always just say, no, I don't carry cash or whatever. I should say, where'd you go to church? You know, I should get after him, but I'm just, I don't know. Maybe I'm not bold enough. I'm not like Peter. Anyway. <clears throat> I mean, people, but people object to this, and, I, and it just, it always kind of boggles my mind and just kind of bugs me. I get more mad at the person I see handing money out on the exit ramp to the person, to the bum, than I do the bum, right? Because it's like, don't you understand what the Bible says? It says that even when, even, for, even when we were with you, this we commanded you. It was a command that if any would not work, neither should he eat. Yeah, I mean, amen. stop feeding these guys and watch how quick they get their act together. Right, yeah. Watch how quick they're willing to go stand at some drive through window and say, do you want fries with that? I mean, they'll, they'll say, hey, can I work here and get a free meal every shift? You know, they'll get paid and get fed. I mean, yeah. if, they shouldn't, if they don't work, you shouldn't eat. That's what the Bible right. says. Mm -hmm. And that goes against the grain of our society today, but that's, that's what it says. <clears throat> you know, but we should be willing to help those that are within the local church. The Bible says in Galatians 6, as let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. As we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men. If you can help somebody out, I mean, even if they're outside the church, do good unto all men. I mean, maybe there is somebody who has a genuine need, they're a good person, they're not just some drug addict, they're not just something, they're just, they really could deserve the help. By all means, help that person. I'm not saying that just because they don't come to church, they can never, they're not worthy of your help. Do good unto all men, it says. But then it says this, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. I mean, if you'd help your neighbor out with something, how much more your brother in Christ, the Bible Amen. saying. And, and that's why, you know, when, you, when someone forsakes the church, when somebody leaves church, you know, we should never have this attitude of it's just like, you know, church is this, and then here's my life out here. I mean, it should be like your family. It's like forsaking a spiritual family. At least that's the way it should feel. Yeah. You're, you're forsaking your spiritual brothers and sisters in Christ. I mean, that's how close-knit I believe a church can and should be. You know, of course, not every single person is going to be that way with everybody. But I think we should, you know, especially as a church gets bigger, there should be people in the church that we develop a kinship with, that we would say, this is my brother. You know, that you wouldn't want to forsake them any more than you would your physical brother, you know? Um, the Bible says in Hebrews 10, Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that is promised. 
And let us consider one another to provoke, one, uh, to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is. Some people have a manner of forsaking the assembly, the local church, the coming together of God's people. And so much the more as he see, but uh, excuse me, uh, not forsaking assembling yourselves together as manner of some is, but exhorting one another. You know, we should be getting together to exhort one another and encourage each other. I mean, we need it more than ever. I mean, the right. world is not exactly on our side. We should be coming together every chance we have, every time the doors are open. We can gather together with our spiritual brothers in Christ and hear the preaching of God's word and go out and do God's work and, and get to know each other and build one another up. Amen. And so much the more as you see the day approaching. I mean, this was written back in Paul's day, and he's saying so much the more as you see the day approaching back then. I mean, how much more now when we're seeing all these things falling into place, when we're seeing the new world order and this end times government and the Antichrist and all these things that are going to be coming to pass, potentially maybe even our own lifetime. Don't we think we need each other as Christians, as brothers and sisters in Christ more than ever? Amen. So that's why we should be in our churches. We should take it as a spiritual family. Now, every, every family, like every church, just like every family, they kind of have that distant, estranged relative, right? The uncle who only shows up at family <laughs> gatherings, you know? Let that not be said of us. Let's not be the uncle that only shows up, you know, at, at the big events. Let's be here. Let's be here every single. Let's be the brother and sister that, you know, is there every time uh, we get together. Amen. So, I mean, there was a lot. I don't know how I got off on all that, but, uh, you know, when you're going verse by verse through the book, Sometimes that happens. Yeah. You know, I, I was looking online, and there's like two other guys in other different churches that are going through the book of Matthew right now. Thankfully, I'm a chapter ahead. I don't know if that's good or bad, but but I listened to them. Like, I listened to the to last week from one of them coming down here, and I'm like, man, I should have said that. Oh, that's a good point. And then some of the same things, we, we said a lot of the same things too, but, um, you know, that's going, that's going through the book. You know, that's uh, chapter by chapter, verse by verse. You just kind of take it as it comes, but... You know, just to kind of summarize here, what was it that we talked about tonight? You know, out of all that, we talked about how Jesus suffered, even as we suffer, and how He gives us the ability to empathize with others, even as He can empathize with us. And you know, it's our sufferings that make us capable of that. And you know, we talked about temptation, what it is, what it isn't, and how to resist the temptation. You know, and uh, we talked about how God likes to use just a common man to accomplish great things, and how we should stay together as, as a church body and and give aid to those that are within the church. So with that said, let's go ahead and just close in a word of prayer.